So we're going to get started now. Um, once again, good morning and thank you for joining us on this webinar today on managing flood risk in BC's lower mainland, um, hosted by the Fraser Basin Council. My name is Elena Chia and I also have my colleague Jim Vandervault here co-hosting with me. Um, as you can see on the screen, there are two ways to connect to your audio, either using your computer or you can call in to the phone number listed and the access code provided. So this webinar is part of our BC Regional Adaptation Collaborative Series. Uh, through BC RAC, we support local governments, First Nations, and industries in integrating climate change adaptation into their planning and decision making. And through our BC RAC program, we also have um, a portal for adaptation resources, which you can find on retooling.ca. Uh, which I would strongly encourage everyone to go check out. Some webinar logistics for today. Uh, we're going to keep everyone's audio muted to limit background noise. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, you'll see that on the slide there's a question box that you can send to. Uh, we're going to be having our Q&A session at the end after the presentation. There's also an option if you would like to ask your question verbally, uh, you can let us know in the question box and then we can selectively unmute you. And if for any reason you encounter technical difficulties during the webinar, you can let us know through the question box um, or send an email to FraserBasin at gmail.com. So today, we're really lucky to have two great speakers. Uh, our first is Steve Lickey from the Fraser Basin Council. Uh, he's worked with the FBC since 1998 and is the senior manager responsible for the Watersheds and Water Resources Program, which includes the Lower Mainland Flood Management Strategy. And with respect to FBC's flood program, Steve has coordinated and facilitated interjurisdictional committees delivered communications and public education, and managed technical projects, including flood mapping and modeling, policy reviews, and LIDAR topographic surveys. Steve graduated from Simon Fraser University in 1995 with a master's degree in resource and environmental management. And our second speaker is Carrie Barron from the city of Surrey. Uh, she's a professional engineer with over 30 years of experience in municipal water resources and environmental engineering. Uh, Carrie is the drainage manager for the city of Surrey, whose responsibilities include overseeing the function of the natural and man-made drainage system, floodplain and dike management, climate change adaptation, and sea level rise planning initiatives. She's also been a member of Fraser Basin's Council's joint partnership since 1999 and currently assists with FBC's Lower Mainland Flood Management Strategy. So at this point, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Steve. Thanks very much, Elena, and, and thanks to all of you for your interest uh, in this topic. Look forward to uh, some discussion after the presentation. I'll be focusing on an initiative that's underway right now uh, in BC's Lower Mainland to develop a regional scale uh, flood management strategy. And I won't go through each of these steps, but just to acknowledge that there's quite a bit of context in the history uh, that has led up to this initiative. Most notably was the 2012 release of a cost of adaptation report uh, that put a, a rough cost estimate on, on increasing uh, flood protection, primarily flood protection infrastructure, to deal with sea level rise. And that prompted an initiative, a group that we've been working with, uh, an interjurisdictional committee, the Joint Program Committee, to um, strengthen our approach to flood management and to do some preventative planning and to proactively get ahead of some of the flood related impacts associated with climate change. And so this uh, strategy is really focusing on better uh, protecting communities, increasing resilience, reducing vulnerability uh, from flood risks in the lower mainland. And uh, this map illustrates most of the uh, region uh, of interest from Hope uh, on the right-hand side of the map to the east, uh, and then working out to the mouth of the Fraser River as it enters the Salish Sea. So from Hope to Richmond, from White Rock uh, at, uh, near the U.S. border, up as far as uh, Squamish, which is just off the, the northern end of, of this map. And we're also concerned primarily with two 
regional scale flood hazards, the, the spring freshets of the uh, Fraser River as a result of snow melts and also coastal storm surge, which is more of a winter flood scenario. And uh, so the Fraser Basin Council, we're a non-government organization. We don't have any regulatory role or legislative authority in flood management or, or any of the issues that, that we work on. So that positions us well to be the facilitator and the coordinator. So we bring together the different uh, partners, jurisdictions, stakeholders, uh, interests um, to, to work on complex problems for which there is no single lead agency responsible. But the strength of this initiative is really uh, with the partners uh, and the partnership. Uh, so we have a, a number of uh, local governments, senior government agencies, infrastructure providers that have contributed funding to support this initiative, have shared data uh, to inform uh, some of the technical analysis, and have provided uh, staff time uh, to share their advice and, and experience and expertise. And I certainly also want to acknowledge the partners in terms of advancing other critical work as it relates to flood management and climate adaptation uh, for their own uh, local jurisdiction in parallel with this regional initiative. So the regional initiative is not to replace that uh, localized work, but to, to fill some of the gaps and to add some value. And this uh, slide uh, shows just a sampling of, of uh, the 43 partners that were able to contribute funding. Uh, in phase one. And there were other organizations that maybe they didn't have uh, the, the revenues to contribute but did share data and staff time. So the focus, uh, the, the strategy is organized into three phases. Uh, we've just coming up to completion of phase one and that has really focused on building a better knowledge base and a better understanding of three aspects of flooding in the lower mainland. Flood hazards, and looking at the influence of climate change uh, on those natural hazards. Uh, flood vulnerabilities, what is the extent and depth of flooding and how does that impact on, on homes and, and businesses and infrastructure and the agriculture sector. And the third piece was to take stock of how we're doing in terms of managing this issue. Uh, looking at flood protection infrastructure and the range of policies and practices that are implemented by uh, a wide range of jurisdictions. So that's phase one. Phase two will be taking that information, developing an action plan, uh, and then phase three, uh, moving into implementation. But first, a little bit more on, on uh, the phase one projects. So the first, looking at flood hazards, we really wanted to look at different flood scenarios uh, that we may be vulnerable to in the lower mainland. And the province of BC, with the lower Fraser hydraulic model, um, looked at 140 different Fraser River flood scenarios different degrees of sea level rise, uh, different degrees of influence of climate change on Fraser Basin hydrology, and different uh, flood magnitudes. Uh, and then we retained Kerwood Idell to review that work, uh, but also a number of, of local studies uh, that were undertaken in Squamish, North Vancouver, Surrey, Vancouver, and others, uh, to put forward recommendations around four flood scenarios that would be the basis to assess vulnerability across the region. And they recommended two coastal flood scenarios, a uh, present day scenario with, with current sea level, uh, and, and that was recommended to use a water level of 3.4 meters of geodetic. And scenario B projects out to the year 2100 and, and essentially adds a, a meter of, of sea level rise uh, to that. And it's important to note that this is a this is just looking at the still water level. Uh, it does not account for um, uh, wind and, and wave effects and different kinds of exposure of different coastal communities, um, different beach geometry, those sorts of things. Uh, and we felt this was, this was sufficient in terms of a regional scale vulnerability assessments, um, but much more work needed uh, to refine those water levels for specific communities. And then you'll hear about the Surrey of the city of Surrey example is one of those where they're doing this additional, more detailed work for their local community. The other two scenarios are Fraser River flood scenarios, so the spring freshet. Uh, so scenario C looks at the current design event, uh, which is the flood of written record, which occurred in 1894. And that was associated with, or has an estimated peak flow of 17,000 
cubic meters per second at Hope. And scenario D looks out to the year 2100. We add a, a meter of to the sea level at the mouth of the Fraser, and then there is a moderate effect of climate change in terms of Fraser Basin hydrology. Uh, and that uh, pushes our current thinking around this is that that would increase the peak flow to almost 20,000 cubic meters per second. And the reason for that is while we might expect a, a reduction in the snowpack, uh, we're more likely to get a rapid snow melt and we're more likely to experience precipitation rainfall during the spring freshet. And those are the conditions that bump up the peak flow. So the next two slides show uh, uh, flood extent maps of, uh, in this case, the two coastal scenarios. Um, so you'll see there's not um, a really significant increase in the extent of flooding. There's a few, uh, and it's hard to tell on this scale of map, but certainly the, the North Shore of, of Burrard Inlet, uh, False Creek in Vancouver, uh, Burns Bog in Delta. So some additional areas of flooding. Uh, but perhaps more significant is increased depth of flooding uh, in, in most, uh, if not all, of the areas. This next flood, or flood, uh, next slide uh, shows the two Fraser River freshet scenarios. Again, the darker blue looks at the current design standard, that Fraser River flood of record, and the lighter blue shows additional extent of flooding uh, to the year that would occur in the year 2100. And, and those um, maps are really the, the beginning point of um, assessing flood vulnerability, which is the second project of, of this of phase one of the strategy. Northwest Hydraulic Consultants was retained uh, to undertake the analysis, and they hired a couple subcontractors, including uh, an economist and, a, and an agricultural economist. And they looked at uh, projections for damages and indirect losses in the lower mainland floodplain under each of those four flood scenarios, two coastal and, and two river. And they looked at uh, four specific areas. It's, it's not comprehensive in terms of the full range of potential impacts, but the emphasis was put on buildings, uh, residential, commercial, industrial, and institutional buildings. They looked at uh, select infrastructure and damage and disruption to those uh, kinds of infrastructure. Uh, delays in cargo shipping, primarily as a function of disruption of the transportation infrastructure. And then lastly, they looked at specific impacts to the agriculture sector. I'll just share a few um, of those results. Uh, this slide shows the aggregate uh, cost estimates associated with the four flood scenarios. Uh, so we're looking at the range of 20 to over 30 billion dollars, and, and I should, I did already mention uh, deeper floodwaters uh, projected for year 2100, some additional extents of flooding, but I do want to put a proviso on the year 2100 projections. We did not estimate projections uh, or increases in population or other kinds of community development and growth or perhaps placement of new infrastructure in floodplains. And that's something that could and, and perhaps should be looked at. Uh, this next slide shows the number of communities, uh, municipalities and First Nations that would be um, impacted under the four flood scenarios and, and the total population that would be seeking shelter. So hundreds of thousands of people would potentially be displaced if if uh, multiple dikes uh, failed and, and communities had to be evacuated, and certainly a really significant number of, of First Nations and, and reserve and, and treaty lands also impacted. The next slide shows the building-related losses, uh, primarily direct damages and the cost for repair and reconstruction, but there are some indirect losses uh, included in here associated with uh, uh, rent, uh, investments, uh, employment uh, related to building damages. So also uh, billions, in the order of billions of dollars uh, in each of the uh, building sectors. This slide illustrates examples of some of the infrastructure that uh, is vulnerable to uh, each of these four flood scenarios. Uh, so really significant infrastructure in terms of the hydroelectric grid, uh, transportation sector, um, water and, and wastewater treatment facilities, uh, and the diking systems uh, themselves. The third project, um, looking at flood management, uh, was split into two. Uh, the first focusing specifically on assessing lower mainland dikes. 
Uh, there are 74 diking systems uh, in the lower mainland of BC, managed by 35 different diking authorities. And this represents about half of the diking systems in the province. And I do also want to highlight that the current design standards are for that 1894, the water levels associated with the 1894 flood of record, as well as a 1 in 200 uh, winter coastal storm surge flood. And that, uh, those design standards are important in terms of the findings of the, the dike assessment. In addition to the, the dike crest height, so the height of, of flood protection works relative to the expected water elevation, a number of other factors influence the performance and integrity and, and functioning of dike systems, and these were all uh, included in, in the assessment of, of the different uh, dikes. And I should say that uh, this project, because of budget limitations, was limited to uh, a review, a desktop exercise, so a review of existing studies, reports, surveys, uh, design drawings, those sorts of things. And there are some gaps in our knowledge, particularly around um, uh, seismic uh, considerations. So the results of the dike assessments are uh, somewhat concerning. A uh, majority of the dikes would be failure, are expected to, to be vulnerable to failure by overtopping. Uh, an additional portion may not overtop outright, but there would be a loss of the freeboard in those diking systems. And really, it's only a small portion of dike segments uh, meet current provincial standards for uh, the dike crest height. And when you factor in and average the ratings uh, for all of the different factors, it's still a majority, there are other issues. Uh, and a majority of the dikes um, uh, were rated as uh, in the poor to fair range, uh, a number uh, in the unacceptable to poor range, uh, and then a, a portion in the fair to good. Uh, range once all of the different results are averaged. And there's a couple of primary reasons for this. Um, most of the dikes were rehabilitated, reconstructed uh, under the Fraser River Flood Control Program in the 1970s and 80s, uh, and that the design flood profile has been updated since then, uh, but the, the dikes have not, with some exceptions, they haven't been raised uh, to meet that uh, update in the flood profile. And similarly with the seismic guidelines, most don't meet uh, current seismic guidelines because those weren't in place when the dikes were, were uh, most recently reconstructed. So I'm gonna shift now to next steps uh, in phase two of the strategy. Uh, we're looking at uh, three primary areas of, of focus. Uh, first is to identify priorities across the lower mainland from national, provincial, regional, and local perspectives. Second piece is to review uh, and recommend management options for very diverse local circumstances to help address some of those priorities. And then the third piece is around looking at funding and governance and with an aim to recommend a secure, sustainable funding model for implementation of, of the strategy. And in terms of process, we want to achieve all of that through very significant engagement and consultation and collaboration with uh, the public, with stakeholders, with decision makers, and, and also a uh, leadership committee. And then hopefully moving into phase three of implementation. A little bit more in terms of identifying priorities. Uh, we're still working through our, um, how we're going to be doing this, um, but a couple examples here on this slide. So one would be to overlay um, the status of different dikes and which ones are, are, are most likely to fail and overlay that with the different degrees of vulnerability in different communities. Another consideration would be critical infrastructure and protecting those areas where critical infrastructure um, serves um, the, the broader uh, region for provincial and national interests and, and they would impact people far beyond uh, the floodplain. Uh, and I already did mention uh, the importance of consulting with, with all of our partners and, and others to help set those priorities. A little bit more in terms of reviewing and recommending management options. There's a number of criteria that we want to take into consideration, a mix of economic, environmental, and social criteria. Uh, perhaps first and foremost is, is the effectiveness, uh, what flood mitigation options are most effective, uh, uh, technical feasibility, what are the limits in terms of, of engineering, uh, the costs, uh, the benefits, consulting with First Nations and, and integrating uh, their interests into the strategy. 
uh, the environmental uh, pros and cons of different management options, and then certainly the, the values and preferences and interests of the public and a variety of stakeholders. On the funding and governance, we're really wanting to clarify these questions. Who will pay for flood mitigation in the lower mainland? Um, how can we cost share in that? What are the appropriate funding sources and mechanisms? And who makes uh, decisions around what is invested, so where and when? So lots of tough questions to, to address uh, over the next uh, couple of years, um, but again, really uh, fortunate to have a, a strong and diverse partnership, and we're looking to extend that uh, as we as we undertake this work. All of the detailed technical reports and summary reports are available through this uh, web link, and uh, we'll, I'll stop there and uh, pass the, the stage over to Carrie. So thanks very much. Look forward to your questions. Hello there. So I'm going to take it a bit different from Steve and take you down to the local government level. So um, at Surrey for a while now we've been working on what's our uh, vulnerabilities, a lot of technical, and then how do we bring that in to integrate into the community and the work we do. Um, so for, for those who aren't from probably BC and don't know, um, our, we have a, the sea level rise projections which I see my line has kind of gone crazy there, but it's uh, 1 meter by 2100, 2 meters by 2200, um, and that's what a lot of us are working to. This is uh, brought up by the provincial government. But when you're dealing with this mean sea level rise, you also have going to have higher surges because the water is deeper, you're going to have bigger waves, your exposure is really critical, and there's also, some of us also have subsidence as a critical issue. In Surrey, some of the land is subsiding as fast as the sea level is rising, in which case um, ex we could potentially have double the number that's being reported. So when we heard all of this information coming at us, we decided let's do some technical studies on the issue. Uh, we did a couple, um, where are we most vulnerable on our coast is also where two of our biggest rivers uh, discharge. What is the effect of not just sea level rise on our coastal community, but on our rivers that discharge to this area? How is subsidence going to be, um, what, uh, what is it? Like what's the number? Is it the same across Surrey? Is it variable? So we did information on that. Rainfall trending studies, looking at the actual Surrey gauges. Historically, we've been keeping them up for many years now, projecting those out um, changing our IDF curves, using different methodologies to do that. Um, and then also downscaling the big global models and the more recent ones to look at what will that do to rainfall potentially. And then also geotechnical su suitability. We know what it could happen, but since our soils are sort of soft, could we actually build some of the work to the heights we need to actually address some of these problems? So I'll just run through a few of the real high level things we got off of uh, some of our studies, we found that almost all of our coastal dikes will be too low by 2100. That's a pretty easy fact. Uh, they're actually, if you see some of them, they all may be too low well before then. Uh, many sections of our dikes along our river systems will also be too low. We have a little more time on those ones, so you'll see in a minute. And then by 2100, a lot of our bridges on the rivers uh, will not um, be able to handle the flows in the river. And they haven't been designed for these scenarios. So this, again, gee, when I'm replacing these bridges, I have to design for a new scenario. So I'm just going to run through. This is kind of the time projection of what we're seeing in Surrey of when we're going to be vulnerable on different ones. There's a couple frontages already a little bit vulnerable now. The, the one, the longest red section is actually a, a BNSF rail. It's not a dike, um, which is the lowest spot on the system for that area. The other one is, is not a front line. It doesn't have waves directly, so we're not as worried. But as you see, as we go through time, it will just, the coast area gets worse and then it goes up our river system. And again, the, the pictures on the left here, that's what we're seeing right now at a king tide. So when we have the really high tides in November, December, January, uh, we all love to be on watch at Christmas. Um, this is what we're seeing in our communities. This is what we're seeing on our dikes. Um, the picture in the middle is Matt, who works with us um, at Surrey, 
And he's showing the lower kind of line you see on each one of those is pretty much where the dikes should be now. Some of them are a little low, you can see. And then the upper line is the actual 2100 elevation. And again, the one area on the top is a little more sheltered, so it's not as bad. The one on the bottom is full exposure to the Strait of Georgia. So it, the waves, the surge, and everything will have much more of an impact on that one, potentially. At the same time we were doing our technical studies, we also said, hey, we got to do something more than just technical. We were, we were rewriting our sustainability charter. We were developing our climate, climate action strategy, our climate adaptation strategy, which is part of our, our bigger uh, climate action strategy. And out of our climate adaptation strategy and the sustainability charter, uh, we came up, especially in the one, with over 100 recommendations on things in general we should be doing at the city uh, for adaptation. And in that, one of the big ones was we need to continue our uh, conducting analysis on our specific climate impacts, timelines, extents, um, and its relation to flood construction levels and floodplain designation. So we, we had this, we know what kind of where we were going, we had a lot of our technical work started behind this. We were also redoing our OCP, official community plan at the time, and we said, hey, you know, everybody who lives um, kind of in these significant hazard areas, the steep slopes, which are all the bluffs around the ocean pretty much, and also the floodplains, they can't build the same way. We need something in our, our OCP official community plan that we trigger people in these certain areas that they have to follow different guidelines, they have to be aware, they have to build differently. So we introduced development permit guidelines for hazard lands, which are for our steep slopes and flood, floodplain areas. So to try to integrate these philosophies throughout the city. It's not just an engineering problem. We also go, went, how do we have money for this? Um, at the city, drainage is a utility. So we have a separate levy on all the parcels in, in Surrey to pay for drainage. In which case, we put in our 2014 tenure servicing plan, which is how we um, project uh, what kind of money we need in the future. And we've also, uh, put it again in our 2016 plan, so that we have money to do the studies, we have money to do the investigations and mappings, and then to partner with people, so that we don't have to go to council and ask all the time, this is, council adopted this, this is in our 10-year plan, this is part of our core function, and it's part of our funding with the drainage utility. So now we've kind of been integrating into the whole city, we have some money to pay for at least the studies and things, and it's, it's kind of an equi like a, we have as utility fees and we've also worked it into our development cost charges where it's applicable. So it helps us with the renewals and all those kind of things also. Oh, this picture is actually one of our, I'll be talking about it soon, it, it's one of the current uh, coastal flood pump stations that we rebuilt specifically for climate change. Um, it was an old pump station anyway. Uh, but we, we've built it so that it can, it'll, by its end of life, it'll be able to handle the water levels at that time, which are significantly higher than now. We've also been including, like I said, in our design and construction projects, we've been including these concepts of sea level rise, changing climate. So uh, we have some very old sea dams. We've done the preliminary designs on those. Uh, I'll be furthering that one. We've been looking at our uh, some local areas of dikes, the Nickelwine dikes, our maple pump station, which you just saw, Crescent Beach, that's not only are we having um, to protect at the coastal area, so their dike structures, but in, inside the town, we're seeing groundwater emergence because it's been subsiding a bit, and also with the tides coming up, the groundwater has been coming up, and so we had to deal with that also. When you're dealing with some of these coastal and floodplain issues, it's not just about protecting or a dike structure. There's a lot that you have to do behind the dikes to make sure they don't flood there too. Uh, we've been replacing pump stations, and a lot of these pump stations, um, we have it so that they can be expanded in the future, that for end of life, they're at the proper height. Pumps can be, when the pumps are at the end of life, they can be um, raised, the shafts are long enough. As the land subsides, we can lower some of these stations. That's our low-level pumps. Um, and then also we're going to be doing a significant upgrade on the Colbert dikes. For the sea dams, uh, this shows you pictures of the, of the sea dam as it exists now. It's over 110 years old. When we replace it, we're looking at how do we make it so as water levels go up, we can move the gates up higher so that 
that continues so they're not always submerged to increase fish passage. We also looked from our studies, we're going to sometime probably need a pump at the river systems. Um, and then how do we extend the dams higher? You're not going to build the dam high enough now, you're going to build it what you need now and then, or what you may need in 30 to 50 years and then, but have designed the base so that they can extend it in the future. So all of these kind of future asset management, asset end of life are trying to be worked into our projects at this time. Um, Colbrook Dykes, at the one time the Colbrook Dykes were not the city's responsibility. They were actually a private diking district's responsibility. Um, and that diking district folded a few years ago. The province has since given the city money to upgrade these dikes uh, to current standards. But at that same time, the city's taken it on to um, take on the Colbrook Diking Districts, and we had a little bit of dikes on either side of those. We're going to actually upgrade the whole stretch from the Delta border to King George Boulevard. And we're going to actually get enough land to be to 2100 standards of what we would need the dikes to be then. And also we're going to build the base of the new dikes so that we can easily extend them next time, say in 50 years, to be the higher level that they're going to need for the next 50 years. So we're trying to design into these dikes a larger um, a future raising, um, not just status quo for now. We've been doing a lot. We've started a big process also with our community. So the Crescent Beach community, we uh, held a series of charrettes to talk about adaptation. Um, Crescent Beach is probably the biggest population in one area in Surrey that's in the, in the coastal floodplain area. It's a community of about 400 homes. Um, it's a lot of seniors. It's a beautiful beachside community. But they are very aware that they live in a floodplain. They are very aware of the coastal hazards. How do we make sure we talk to them? We, we wanted to make sure we, that they knew their potentials from sea level rise, that they knew the potentials from climate change on their community. We wanted to find out their values. I mean, we could all do things to save a community or to protect a community, but if it doesn't coincide with the values of that community, you could be in a lot of political trouble. Um, you've got to know what the community wants, what they hold dear, and have them be a part of the design or, or give you some ideas of what they would like to see once they know um, the problem. And part of the charrette is we had them building. So yes, Play-Doh was a key part of our charrettes with dollar store plants and all kinds of things that we gave them to say, okay, after you've known your threat and you know some of the things you can do, we showed them examples of other things, have them talk about how they think they could protect the community. What kind of ideas resonated the best with them? Now, we, this may not happen like this, but it gives us a good idea of how they could integrate the values that the community has in with uh, moving forward in the works. Now, it was kind of a test case for our bigger coastal flood strategy. So we, we tested this very little community and how we, to engage them in things. And now we're going to this larger coastal flood ad adaptation strategy. And in this, it's going to be pro it has many more stakeholders, uh, much more public engagement. And the goal is to prepare Surrey for a changing climate and to help for our coastal communities in becoming more resilient. What's going to be interesting about our adaptation strategy is we're, we're not going to talk just about protect. We're also really retreat has to be talked about with the residents. It doesn't mean it's going to be the selected option, but we're not, you can't omit that in the dialogue. And we're not omitting our neighboring communities too. Delta is, um, is a participant, White Rock, semi First Nations, uh, Langley's have been coming um, because it's more than just what Surrey can do to protect Surrey. We have our adjacent neighbors. Is there something we can all do that benefits each other a little better? So in the communities, we're not, we're not like a big community. We only have 1,500 residents in the floodplain area, most of which are in Crescent Beach and some of the um, smaller communities along some rivers. Um, but we do have a huge amount of agricultural land. We also have um, a lot of uh, a wildlife management area. The whole Boundary Bay is a wildlife management area. It's one of the Western Hemisphere Ramsar areas too. So it's environment and the natural environment is a huge process. Coastal squeeze is going to be a reality if we all just do dike treatment. How do we work those kind of values into it? Um, the regional economy or local economy. So we have the gate sales of the farms, but also we have a lot of access 
through trucks and everything coming through Surrey. We have provincial highways in this floodplain. We have um, the main rail line to the U.S. in this floodplain. We have a lot of cars going through this area. What is the, what do we do for them too? And, and so you can see there's a, many more different interest groups as we go along with the coastal flood. So how are we engaging? Who are we engaging? We're going to try to engage the neighborhoods, the communities, the First Nations, the provincial ministries, environmental groups, businesses, etc. cetera. Um, we're going to do it through a variety of, we're going to have in-person, we're going to have newsletters, we're going to have information, web, you name it. We're up for any kind of um, attempt to try to engage the community. A lot of times it is very good when you're talking about what's going to happen to their uh, properties, their businesses, and having them have a say in, in all this. We've just started. Um, we have five phases proposed. Um, we're in just the beginning where it's what matters most and who's affected. Um, this this uh, process is being run for us by Northwest Hydraulics and Ecoplan. Uh, we have also had uh, a bit of our kickoff. Yesterday was our first tour. Um, I can talk about that in a second. And what can, so our first one is what matters, who is affected, finding out what people, their values, finding out, uh, building the awareness in the different groups, exploring our options, uh, finding out what options are acceptable. And the whole time we're doing all these phases, the community and our stakeholders run a big part. We have over 100 different engagement um, meetings planned, not all with the same group of people. Um, some will be focus groups, some not. For our first phases, we're looking at the hazards and vulnerabilities, public values, preliminary adaptations. Again, yesterday we did a tour of a lot of the coastal area with part of the group. Um, and when we do these tours, it's not just the city or the consultant talking to the group. We really want to engage the people to tell us their stories. So one of the stories yesterday was a farmer telling us what he had lived through, the different flooding events, having the Crescent Beach Community Association talk about what it's like in their community having the Semiamu First Nations talk about the history of their community and on this area. So to really try to um, engage and listen as opposed to just telling or informing, we want to have a really good dialogue with this uh, as we develop our strategy moving forward. And that's it. Well, thank you so much, Carrie and Steve, for both your presentations. Uh, at this time, we're going to move into our Q&A session. I, I see there's already a few questions on our list, and please, you know, take some time to reflect on questions for our speakers. Uh, the first one is directed to Steve, um, and yes, yeah, what would happen if the actual sea level rise in 2100 is two meters? Well, I think what we want to do is, is monitor the science as it evolves. So hopefully we would get some earlier indications that the, the pace of sea level rise uh, is faster than we predicted and we would need to ramp up our, our efforts. I think it might also, um, and, th and that's something that our group has encouraged us to include in our communication. I mean, while, we, while we set one meter in 2100 as a target, um, we want to acknowledge that it's likely it could happen at a faster pace and it, and it likely will exceed that beyond 2100, if not earlier. So we definitely need to take that into account. Uh, but yeah, if, if we if we aim for one meter and it was two meters, then you have catastrophic flooding. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, and the second question is for Carrie. In your presentation, you had talked about um, some development guidelines and vulnerable areas. And this question asks, what about a complete stop to further development in low-lying vulnerable areas? Um, well, we, we don't have a complete stop because it's very difficult for lots of record. But we do have a policy within Surrey of no subdivision within some of these areas. So um, we're trying to make sure that there's no new developments in some of our vulnerable floodplains, but we can't stop an owner from rebuilding his house. We haven't gone that far because that kind of sterilizes a lot and council's not really to, I mean, you'd have to purchase the guy if you're not going to let him build again. Um, but we're not letting new subdivisions come into these areas. Um, and a question for both of you. Um, are there, are your plans taking into consideration the recently released that's Metro Vancouver climate change projections? 
we haven't yet, um, but as I said, we are wanting to to stay current uh, as the science evolves. So I made a note of that. And I'll look into that. Thank you. Uh, one comment from a participant. Fantastic presentation. Uh, and for Steve, um, under the scenario C and D damage assessment, so what were the bridge damages estimated to be? Um, and were there specific spots, or was that a gen generic estimate? No, there were specific bridges that were identified um, that would be damaged, and then there were. They, I, I should qualify the infrastructure <coughs> loss estimates are, are quite coarse. Um, so there was an identification of what infrastructure is vulnerable, i.e. it's exposed, it's in a floodplain, or what portion of that infrastructure. And then there were some cost estimates based on some work that FEMA has done in the U.S. So if that is something that we should look more specifically at uh, the lower mainland circumstance um, and specific infrastructure on the ground uh, to refine that analysis. I don't have, I can't recall offhand which bridges. Uh, I know one of them was a rail bridge. Um, but I could look, I could follow up with, with uh, that individual. Sure, I can help connect the both of you on that. Um, and a question for Carrie, how are you operationalizing your new IDF curves and have you already adopted them as design? Um, they, they, you can talk to some of the consultants working in Surrey, they'll tell you about what we've done with the new IDF curves. So all we've done is we updated our IDF curves for just current. Uh, so we took data to about 2014 um, and then updated the curves that were lost on in 94 and have those as our base in our design criteria that came out this year. Um, yeah, it has caused a bit of a stir because those actually in some places were up to 10 to 20 percent higher just between the last uh, couple decades, not even. Um, and then uh, going forward though, we haven't released the new ones for climate change because what we have is we have a study underway with Associated Engineering where we've given them different parts of town, different stages of development, and asked them to run the various curves on those, tell us what it will do to servicing, and we're looking at can we even continue to service the same way as we do now, or do we actually have to throw out our servicing strategy that we currently use because it's changing so fast and come up with a new way of servicing areas. So when you're looking at these things, sometimes the old practices may not work, and so we're trying to get an understanding is can we keep up with this through just bigger pipes or through overland flow controls, et cetera, or do we have to have it so houses aren't connected or do we have to do it for the sump pump kind of thing? So we're really looking at what does this mean to different areas, but that one will be released probably early next year, that report. Great, thanks, Terry. Um, and a question about the Corporation of Delta, whether they're cooperating with similar dike improvements at the west end of the Boundary Bay Dike Project. Um, right now, Delta's dikes are higher than the Surrey dikes. So um, Hugh has his own plan, or Delta has their own plan over there right now, and we are talking. Um, it's just we're going to be probably building it a little higher than their current dike, but right now we're probably almost a meter lower than their dike itself. Mm -hmm. um, and another comment of great presentation from the both of you. Uh, what storm surge forecasting are you using and do you have plans for evacuation routes and um, signage for tsunami, storm surge, or flooding? Um, I'll take that one. So I'm using uh, the storm surge model, the BC storm. Storm surge forecasting? Yeah, model. yeah. So, so the one, the storm surge forecasting model. We also in Surrey, we have different, at our pump stations, we actually have uh, level gauges we've placed at sea dams and pump stations along the bay so that we can see how, even though the model, we have different winds and things that hit us than other parts uh, where the, the Point Atkinson um, gauges. So we also try to relate what's coming with the wind and how it's going to affect us. So we kind of monitor separate too, but we use the storm surge model. And what was the second part? about um, oh, tsunami. Oh, um, we don't have tsunami signage. Um, I think the emergency management group regionally here is working on some things. Uh, our tsunami vulnerability isn't as high as on the island from what I believe. 
we have talked to the community, the Crescent Beach in particular, because they're probably my most vulnerable community for tsunamis. And we have talked to them, and we have told them just go hide. <laughs> uh, earthquake comes, just get out of Dodge, really, and go up the hill, which is just behind their places. So we don't have the full kind of signage like I know they do on the island. We're, we haven't gone that road at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Elena, in terms of the regional strategy, although the focus is on proactive, preventative approaches to flood mitigation, we do think that uh, the information that's being developed will be quite informative and useful for emergency uh, planners, emergency managers, in terms of identifying the kinds of critical facilities that might be at risk and, and the, the population that might be seeking emergency services. So that is something that we want to strengthen in the next phase of work is to connect with emergency managers on this. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Steve. Um, and a comment that there is very good science already suggesting much higher levels up to five meters by 2100. How is SBC or Surrey considering the implications of this to preserve or maximize the enduring value of the implied limited financial resources? So. Yeah, good question. I'm not sure I entirely um, comprehend it, but I think when we're reviewing management options, uh, one thing we need to take into account is life cycle costs, and we need to align that with the, the timing of increases in, in flood hazards. Um, so that's one piece. And I think the other is is like the example that Carrie gave, um, and this is something that was supported by the Joint Program Committee uh, uh, last week, and that is to uh, implement flood mitigation options that strengthen flexibility and, and keep options open in, in the future. So if we do need to, to adjust, um, that we haven't painted ourselves into a certain corner. Um, but I mean, if, if the reality is a jump from one meter to five meters in 2100, um, we definitely have our work cut out for us in yeah. terms of planning and, and rapidly, much more rapidly mobilizing. Yeah. And it's very difficult to get a community, commu when you talk to these communities, if you say 2100, they kind of glaze over. Most of these people are going to be dead by then that you're talking to right now. In which case, you've got to present it more in their lifetime, what they're going to see and how it would change over time and what we need to do for them now, um, you know, and that you design for 50 years out. But it's, it's very difficult to have these people who live in these areas, because you're looking at walls, you're looking at very significant infrastructure that's going to need to be put in. Um, and I can tell you from having raised a dike in front of some of these homes before, it doesn't go nicely. Uh, you really have to work with them. And you really have to be realistic. They will not accept something for 2100 today. They will want to see it phased. They will want to see um, as little change to them as possible in some of these communities. So it's a, quite a challenge. The, people don't just agree with science. Yeah, very good point, Kenny. Um, and from another one of our participants is asking if Either of you have looked at the Green Shores Coastal Development Standards uh, from the Stewardship Center of BC as an alternative to hard shore armoring treatment. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We were we were uh, fortunate to have a presentation on Green Shores at our, our flood committee meeting last week, and I, I see that as a great example that would be included in the in the, the range of flood mitigation options that are considered. And that's another piece that we want to do is, is some research around those, uh, you know, in quotes, alternative approaches to flood mitigation or perhaps the emerging or, or innovative mm -hmm. approaches to flood mitigation in, in other jurisdictions. We want to do some work around yeah. that. Part of our Colbert dikes that I talked about, the upgrading there, anything exposed to kind of the strait or the bay is actually, we required a consultant to do, we called it Green Shore like because we didn't belong to Green Shores at the time. So they are supposed to do a softer coastline, a more gentle rise, more environmentally focused. Um, in Crescent Beach, um, say at the south end in the past, we did try to do some of that in Crescent Beach in the past, not to this extent that Green Shores is doing it now, but that is on our radar and we are trying to implement it in uh, part of our Colbert Dyke upgrades where we can. Great to hear. Um, and a question for Carrie: Do the mayor and council see a role for themselves in raising the public profile of the issues, 
or connecting with provincial and federal elected officials? Um, well, our mayor and council are the ones who wanted this thing brought forward, wanted a huge public, like the biggest thing them is bring, bring this coastal strategy forward, but they wanted the public involved. They did not want to do it separate from the public and just be a technical exercise. Um, Surrey's mayor and council have, uh, Surrey has a lot of floodplain area. Um, our two river systems are all dikes. They're very um, well versed in drainage in Surrey. Uh, and it has been an issue with them. They will be bringing up when we have our strategy results uh, and they do get involved um, and we will be doing regular updates to them. It's not a new topic for them. They've been involved from day one uh, for many, many years in Surrey on the flood issues. This is just the latest in the series. Mm -hmm. um, and for, for both Carrie and Steve, what are the speaker's thoughts on the impact of coastal squeeze on local ecosystems uh, do you have a sense that other levels of government are interested or concerned from landowners um, or from a natural resource point of view? And some examples, CFO, CPP, Ministry of Environment. Yeah, we, we certainly want to do much more work in looking at the, the interactions between flood mitigation and, and the natural environment and, and advanced flood mitigation options that are conducive to a healthy environment. And the coastal squeeze is certainly a, an issue of concern. Uh, so one of the recent suggestions was to do um, a bit of an inventory or assessment of, of the current um, foreshore habitat uh, and its vulnerability to coastal squeeze. And I think that issue does maybe encourage us to think about um, stepping back flood protection infrastructure from the shoreline to give room for that foreshore habitat to migrate inland as the sea level comes up. Um, I think there, in terms of broader support, I think it's mixed. I think there are a number of communities that are have looked at this more closely and maybe earlier on and some that maybe isn't hitting the radar yet. Um, but we're hopeful that so we can um, integrate these kinds of considerations into the development and implementation of the strategy. Our whole coastal floodplain strategy has a big environmental component. Um, we would like, say, the DFOs, Environment Canada's, Wildlife People, Flynn Rose, them to be part of this engagement process as one of the stake, as stakeholders because it's really hard. Say we come up with a strategy and then we go to do the works and if they haven't been involved in the consultation up front and we're just going to them for approvals, it takes a lot longer. It's a, it could make the strategy fall apart. I know there's staffing challenges at a lot of the organizations, um, and there was more staff available in the past to, to help coordinate up front, but we're you know, hopeful that we can get them coming and helping as we develop the strategy to sign off as they have with other strategies. Uh, thanks, Carrie. Uh, so our next question is looking at emergency preparedness. So is there consideration to build vertical evacuation structures for during a flooding event um, that are accessible and still allow people to live in flood and tsunami prone areas? Um, elderly and infirm should not be living in these areas uh, because of the difficulty evacuating them. Um, so what are some considerations that you might have with dealing in these issues? Yeah, we haven't gotten that far in terms of the regional lower mainland flood strategy specific emergency response options. Um, as I said before, we're, we're really trying to encourage more preventative approaches. We want to, so many places around the world, they wait for a big disaster and then they decide to rethink things. So we're trying to get ahead of that and do that differently here. Um, but also, as I said before, we do think this information can help inform those with this kind of expertise. So, uh, yeah, I hope that we can engage with them, uh, but no, we haven't thought of specific emergency response measures of the kind that we're, that we're suggesting. Yeah. Um, in Surrey, we do actually have different plans. We're not building routes so people can live in their house during the flood. Like in the farmlands, the houses are higher, the farmers know the lands flood. They can stay in place, so the tide goes down, they'll recede. Crescent Beach, we have an evacuation plan uh, along our Fraser River. Even though it's dike protected, when the water comes too close, we're not going to wait for the dike to break. We're going to evacuate well ahead of time. And we, um, just because we've done the modeling of how quick a dike breach would inundate an area. That even though people 
we want the people to have their houses raised so the houses are protected after a flood, but we don't necessarily um, encourage them to live in these areas. Now, the Fraser flood would be a longer term flood because it'd be weeks. Uh, a coastal flood will be more of a short duration because of the tidal cycle. Related to that, Elena, um, one of the suggestions recently was that maybe there are some projects that we can undertake in phase two that would help with individual uh, emergency preparedness and help with business continuity and, and, and providing some advice or information on, on how individuals, households, businesses can steps that they can take so there would be less impact. Um, so that may be kind of getting into the direction mm -hmm. that was into that line of question. Yeah, good recommendation. Uh, so we only have a few more minutes of time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, but before I continue, I'm just going to um, bring up our introduction slide where you can see the contact information for both me and Jim Vanderwall. So if there are questions that you have that we haven't been able to get to in our Q&A portion, please feel free to email them to us and we can help connect you with our speakers. Um, so our next question is an interesting one. Uh, what are the potential benefits of flooding and when would these benefits be realized? Well, I mean, floods are natural processes and, and there would be no um, Fraser Delta uh, estuary if, if big rivers at high flows didn't transport sediment. Uh, so some, certainly some of the um, you know, ecosystem forming processes, you know, flooding is that cycle is part of that. Um, all the that sediment transport uh, results in the fertile uh, Fraser Valley agricultural soils. Um, under the present situation. I guess a, a different kind of concern is the kinds of contaminants and pollutants that would be mobilized in a flood. Um, so it's hard to know whether there would be a net gain or, or a net loss uh, in terms of fuels and hazardous waste and those kinds of things being in that mix of floodwaters and potentially contaminating wells, um, ecosystem habit habitats, all kinds of, of other things. Um, so because we've managed it and the stuff that we've put in floodplains, I think, I wonder if there would be more adverse impacts than, than, than benefits. But that is something that we need to think through. And maybe there are, so people might be familiar with the Netherlands and their room for the river policy. And if you, if you give more room for those natural processes to occur, then, and you can sort of contain floodwaters within a, a relatively clean, in quotes, floodplain, uh, maybe we can. Um, I guess renew some of those uh, benefits from flooding. Yeah. Some of our, low, in, in Surrey, and some of our lowland strategy um, up our rivers, uh, especially where the upland area meets the lowlands, so where you meet the steep, meet the flat, we actually have flood cells. And they're rich ecosystems in these flood cells because you do have the mix, you do have the periodic turnovers. We don't have the massive oil and stuff coming down the river, Steve. It's not that kind of flood. Um, and along the Fraser too, Surrey Bend Regional Park is a good example. That park floods yearly at Freshet. And that's what makes it so rich in its habitat and its forms of it. So a lot of it just has to do with the natural cycle. And these are areas where we don't have people living. These are more of a natural kind of a process. But it's getting that mix. So. Right, well. I know it's 12 o'clock right now, so it's come to the end of our webinar. And for the questions that we haven't been able to get to, I will forward those to our speakers and we can follow up on that. And as I mentioned before, uh, feel free to give me an email at echia at fraserbasin.bc.ca and I can also help connect your further questions to our speakers. Uh, so a big thank you to both Steve and Carrie for joining us this morning and providing an awesome presentation and for that great um, interactive Q&A session. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.